I invite you to take your Bibles tonight, open to the uh, Old Testament book of First Kings. As we study First Kings, we're in chapter 14 tonight, and I want you to look down at verse number 21, First Kings chapter 14, verse 21. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, the, uh, the life of Rehoboam and his death. And the title of the sermon tonight is Shields of Bronze or Shields of Gold. And we'll see this, uh, the reason for this title as we get into our study. In a small town, there were two brothers who over the course of years had a business and they cheated and swindled and robbed uh, basically everybody in town. Um, the entire community pretty much despised these brothers, and one of the brothers mysteriously died. And the other brother went to the local pastor, and even though they didn't go to church, the uh, other brother asked the pastor to please preach a good sermon for his brother. In fact, he offered him a lot of money if he would preach him a good eulogy, and he even offered a bonus if somewhere along the line in the eulogy he would use the expression that his brother was a saint. Well, the pastor was kind of troubled by this request, but it was a very poor church, and they needed the money. Word got out to the community of the pastor's dilemma, and they come to hear what he would say. And so that day for the service came, the auditorium was packed. Uh, when the pastor got up to give the eulogy, he basically said, you, you all know that this departed man was a horrible person, that he basically robbed and cheated and swindled and stole from everyone that he did business with. But I want you to know that compared to his brother, he was a saint. Well, you know, that story basically teaches us that we all love to keep up appearances, right? We like to kind of give a, present an outward public um, image that's often not really who we are. Perception versus reality. That's kind of the, uh, what, what is going on here in our passage. The writer is comparing basically brother nations, uh, nation of Judah versus the nation of Israel. Remember, we're at the time in Israel's history where it's a divided nation. He's comparing the kings of these nations, Jeroboam. We already saw in chapter 14 that he died, and he was a wicked king. But immediately the writer now looks at the king of Judah, Rehoboam. And unfortunately, what he sees is that Rehoboam was not much better than Jeroboam. In fact, he was just as wicked, every bit as wicked as Jeroboam was. But Rehoboam was a man who wanted to present to the kingdom a good image. He wanted to portray this idea that everything was going great in the kingdom of Judah. However, it was far from good. Things were far from great. Look at verse number 22 of chapter 14. And, and Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. This was a low point in the nation of Judah in the kingdom of David. Rehoboam had led the people into serious apostasy, and the Bible says they provoked the wrath of God um, even more so than the generations that were before them. And yet Rehoboam, as the king, was acting like everything was going good. He probably had pollsters out there taking polls, and they were probably saying everything was great. He probably took surveys among the people to ask if they were better off than they were five years ago since he was the king. But no one asked God how things were going. And God in his wrath punished Rehoboam and the nation of Judah. Look down at verse number 20, um, 25. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all that he took away... Uh, he even took away, and he took away all of the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Now, in the fifth year, the Pharaoh of Egypt, Shishak, decides to come up against uh, Judah and Israel. And that's kind of ironic because during the reign of Solomon, Solomon was trying to establish a friendly alliance with the nation of Egypt. Uh, this great king of Egypt once had given his own daughter to Solomon as a wife. But this didn't help Rehoboam. Now the Pharaoh of Egypt decides that he's going to take advantage of the weakened condition of Judah and Israel. Since this was a divided kingdom, this was a great chance 
to establish his supremacy there in the land of Palestine. And so he has a military campaign into the Levant, and he begins to systematically conquer and take over villages and towns, 156 as a matter of fact. And really, the, uh, his whole campaign uh, is inscribed on a temple in Egypt in Ammon, e- uh, the Ammon Temple there in Karnak, Egypt. It describes this military campaign that Shishak the Pharaoh conducted against Jerusalem and against the land of, of Israel. You know, what this tells us is, you know, here was Solomon trying to establish a relationship with this Egyptian king. But when a child of God tries to go to the world for help, it will always hurt them. So what happens? Shishak comes into the Jerusalem, and Rehoboam is humbled. The Bible, it doesn't tell us here, but in Second Chronicles chapter 12, Rehoboam humbles himself before the Lord, and he prays to God. And you know what? God answers his prayer because Shishak doesn't ultimately wipe out the whole city of Jerusalem. He basically takes some treasures. By the way, when the pressure was off, Rehoboam went right back into sinning against God. You know what that's called? That's called foxhole religion. You know, when you're in trouble, you pray, you cry out to God, but when the trouble is over, you go back to doing the things that you were doing before. And this is exactly what Rehoboam did. And one of the ways in which he was able to survive this crisis was he, was to, he bought Shishak off by giving him the vessels of the treasury of the temple. Now, normally when a foreign enemy came into a city, the first place they would go would be the temple of that foreign city because that was normally where the treasures were kept. And Shishak went in and he took the treasures of the temple. And among those treasures, he took, the Bible says, 500 golden shields. Look down in verse number 26. And the king took away from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasury of the king house. He even took away all that he took away of all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. These were 500 shields. And this is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 10. It says that when Solomon was building the temple, he had 500 shields lined up along the wall of the house of the forest of Lebanon. There were 200 of these were large shields, 300 of these were small shields, and they were put on display in a beautiful way, lined along the walls there of the house of Lebanon. Now, these, this, these were really for display. I mean, gold is too heavy to really be used in battle. The metal is too soft to be effective as shields. Really what they were is they were symbols of the greatness of Solomon's kingdom. And whenever Solomon would go to the house of God for worship, what the guards would do is they would take those shields and they would uh, guard and escort Solomon as he went to the temple to worship. And then when he left the temple to go back to his palace, again, there was a parade of guards around him with these golden shields. And it was very pompous. It was very impressive, this kind of ceremony to have these guards out there with these gold shields escorting him to and from the house of the Lord. Again, it was a grand showing of the glory and the greatness of the kingdom of Solomon. But now these shields were gone. The Egyptian pharaoh came in and he plundered the temple and he took the gold and he took away these gold shields. According to Dilde, each large shield was worth about $120,000. The smaller shields were worth about thirty. dollars thousand dollars. So if you do the math, you know how much he got away with when he took the shields out of the temple. You ready for this? $33 million worth of gold that he took uh, out of the hands of, of uh, Rehoboam and back to Egypt. By the way, did you know that when the, the, uh, the mummy of King Shishak was uncovered, archaeologists found that he was buried in a golden sarcophagus. Maybe that gold was from the temple there in Jerusalem. So what did Rehoboam do? In their place, not to be deterred, Rehoboam made some bronze shields. Look at verse 27. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them under the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. So what did he do? In their place, he had bronze shields made. Now, the cheap imitation bronze 
we could say really was a symbol of the judgment of God. Rehoboam wanted to go on and pretend that everything was great. You know, the shields, we still have shields. Everything is great. We're going forward. But things were not great. But really what he was doing is he was kind of living a lie. Now, I want you to get this if you don't get anything else. It is spiritually destructive to live a lie rather than facing the truth. Rehoboam could have faced the idea that they were under the judgment of God because of their sins, because they had sinned greatly against God as a nation. He personally, as a king, had sinned greatly against God. But instead of facing up to his sin, instead of repenting and turning to the Lord, he just pretended that everything was okay, that everything was all right. But it was not. The kingdom of Judah was in trouble. So with that in mind, I just want to give you three things that these bronze shields really uh, communicated. The first thing I would say is delusion. Delusion. Rehoboam and Judah were living under the delusion that all was fine. In fact, look, look at verse number 28. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. That is to say, he kept right on using these shields just like before. When he went up to the house of the Lord, the guards would get those shields and they would form an a escort for the king. There would be a parade of escorts that would escort King Rehoboam from the palace up to the house of the Lord. Rehoboam would go to the house of the Lord. He would worship and then he would go back into his palace and those guards again were waiting there with the shields with all the pomp and the ceremony and they would... Uh, escort him back to the palace. Things look the same. In fact, if you polish up those shields just right, they probably looked a lot like gold. They looked the same, but they were not. One interesting thing I find here in verse number 28 is that when the guards got done with the shields, what did they do with them? Look at the end of verse 28, and brought them back into the guard chamber. That's interesting to me. Because what did they do with the original shields that Solomon had? They were lined up along the wall in the house of uh, the tre- of the uh, the house there of, of the forest of Lebanon, the house of the forest of Lebanon. Uh, they were lined up along the walls. But what do they do with these shields here? They put them back into uh, the guardhouse. That's revealing why. Again, because they were no longer on display. You see, everything was carefully done so as to remove any idea that something was wrong, but it was a delusion. Philip Ryken in his commentary wrote this, how the mighty had fallen. Rehoboam's royal court still followed the old rituals, but now Judah was off the gold standard. I like the way he said that. Judah was off the gold standard. The officers of the king carried these bronze shields instead and what Matthew Henry called an emblem of diminution of his glory, the dimming of the glory, the deterioration of the glory. Again, he was pretending that everything was okay, but it was a self-deception. He was living a lie. And I wonder maybe if we could apply this to our own life tonight. You know, as it's, it's the nature of human nature for us sometimes rather than to face some of the things going on in our life, some of the sins perhaps that we have, where we, we have failed the Lord, rather to, to, than confessing them and facing what we've done and asking God for his grace and his help and taking the necessary measures to mortify any sin in our life, there's the tendency on the behalf of many people to simply just pretend that everything is all right and to try to cover it up or forget about it. You know, Christians can be self-deceived. Did you know that? It's the nature of human nature. You know what the Bible says? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know what that means? Our hearts will lie to us. Your heart might say, you know, you're all right. You're doing good when actually you're not doing so good. You're not where you need to be spiritually. 1 John 1, 8 says this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. A lot of times we, rather than dealing with sin in our life, we want to cover it up. We want to smooth it over. We want to say everything is all right. Christians can be self-deceived, but did you know churches can also be self-deceived? Do you remember what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea? 
In Revelation 3.19, he said, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You remember that passage in Revelation? These were harsh words from Jesus to this church. In essence, what Jesus was saying was that to this church is that you make me sick. Boy, I would hate for the Lord to ever say that about me or our church. You make me sick. These are strong words. What was it that made the Lord um, reject and disgust this church? Listen to Revelation 3.17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The key phrase in that verse is, and you, thou knowest not. They were blinded as to their spiritual condition. In other words, they were living a, a self-deception. They thought that they were well. They said, you know what? We don't need anything. We are rich. We are increased with goods. We have need of nothing. We're right where we need to be. That was their perception. But the reality was, Jesus says, no, you're wretched, and you're miserable, and you're poor, and you're blind, and you're naked. Now, it's no uh, accident that Jesus used those particular words. You know why? Because did you know in the city of Laodicea, they boasted about their money? They had a banking system there that was the envy of the world. It was the banking center for all Asia Minor. They also had a, a minted coins. They knew how to detect counterfeit gold. They boasted about their money. They boasted about their medicine. Did you know that in Laodicea, there was a school of medicine? And they had one of their, one of their claims to fame was they had an eye salve that would heal people's eyes. A lot of times people were blinded because of the dryness in that climate. And they had an eye salve that would help people to see. And this was a very important thing and something they boasted about. But they also boasted about their material. Did you know that that city was known for their black wool that they produced? This was an expensive material, and so they took great pride in their expensive clothing that they wore. And so it's no accident that Jesus says, you know, you can boast about your money, but really you're poor. You can boast about your eye salve, but really you're blind. You can boast about your clothing, but you're poor and you're naked, spiritually speaking. That's where they were. That was their condition. And you know what? We need to be careful as God's people that we don't get to the place in our life where our perception is we're doing very well, but the reality is we're not where we need to be. You say, how do we avoid getting to that place spiritually? This is where the Word of God comes in, beloved. Do you know God's Word is a mirror? God's Word shows us what we really are. We know this verse, the word of God is quick and powerful and what? Sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is able to divide asunder the soul and the spirit. God's word is able to do, sink down deep in us and show us where we really are. It, it shows us what the motives of our heart are, what the thoughts of our heart are. As we read God's word, God's word reads us. And it shows us what we really are. And it brings us to the place where we need to be so that we're not living in some delusion. We're not living in, spirit, in, in, in self-deception. But we know exactly spiritually where we are. God's Word does that. That's why it's important to stay under the ministry of the Word of God. It's important to read God's Word in your life. But here's the second thing. These shields really communicated a delusion, but also deterioration. The replacement of the gold with bronze is a perfect picture of the decline and the spiritual deterioration under the days of Rehoboam. They were in spiritual and moral decline. You say why? Very simply, sin. Again, look at verse 22 of 1 Kings. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. Under Rehoboam, the nation sinned again more than all of the fathers of their previous generation. That's saying a lot. And notice what it says that, notice why I call this the jealousy of God, where they provoked God to jealousy in verse number 22, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had 
committed. God became jealous. Did you know in the Old Testament, the Bible says God is a jealous God? In fact, in one place in Exodus 34, it says, God says, my name is jealous. Now, when we think about jealousy in our day, we have the tendency to think negatively on it. In fact, the dictionary definition is feelings of resentment because of another's success. Shakespeare called jealousy the green-eyed monster. But let me just tell you this. Remember this, that the Bible, when the Bible is describing God, the Bible has a very um, huge task. Because what the Bible is doing, it's using human language to describe a God who really is incomprehensible. But the Bible is using the vehicle, which is really an inadequate vehicle. It's using the vehicle of human language to communicate concepts to us about God. So when we say that God is jealous, you need to get out of your mind that negative idea about jealousy. There are certain ways in which the jealousy that we have is like the jealousy that God has, but the writer here is trying to communicate to us an emotion that God has, and yet he's using human terms to do it. Let me give you the theological expression that they give for this. This is called anthropopathism. I would like someone to stand up and spell that word for me. You say, what does anthropopathism mean? It comes from the Greek word anthro, which means man, pathism, which means the emotions And what it's saying is, is that many times in the Bible, the Bible will use the language of human emotion to reveal God to us. So is God jealous? Yes, but not the same way in which we are jealous. When we're jealous, it's really a pride in us. It's really a selfishness in us. Uh, There's something about us that's not entirely right, and so any emotion that we have is corrupt. However, when the Bible says God is jealous, it is a holy jealousy because God is holy and he is sinless. So whatever the jealousy of God is, it is a perfect jealousy. And this word is used to describe an intense uh, wound, a wounded love is really the word here. In fact, it's used in Numbers 5 to speak about a husband who fears his wife has cheated on him. And so when it says that God is jealous, God is jealous when his people find their satisfaction in something other than God, you see. And it's the logic of the verse, do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. God is jealous the same way a loving husband is properly jealous about Uh, toward a wife. And God is wounded when he loves us with this perfect, endless love, this sacrificial love. And in response, we treat him as if what he has done for us is not enough, that we need to find satisfaction in other places besides God. When we look to others for love, for security, for provision, we need... um, the the security that we need, which has been provided by God for us. When we look to others for those needs, rather than trusting in God, then we are committing the sin that the prophets in the Old Testament talked about, which is spiritual adultery. And our God is jealous in that way. It is a holy jealousy. God takes it personal. When you have idols in your life, when there are things and people that you love more than God, that you enjoy more than God, that you put ahead of God, then there is a holy jealousy that God has. And notice how Rehoboam and Judah provoke God. Notice the sins of Judah. Look in verse 23, for they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. What did they do that made God so jealous? They built high, haste, high, excuse me, high places on all the hills, on all the, under, the Bible says, under every green tree. Remember what the high places were? These were little shrines that they would build to sacrifice to false gods. 
they would build up these high places. Israel was filled with those high places. In fact, you can go over Israel today and you could see the ruins of some of these high places that dotted the hillsides there in Palestine where they would go and they would burn incense to a false god. Sometimes they would sacrifice an animal to a false god in one of these high places. Sometimes they would even sacrifice a child if you worship the god of Molech. And that was taking place there. They, were, they had all of these false gods and all of these idols. And God hated these high places. In fact, God commanded Israel, when you go into the land, I want you to tear down all these high places. Get rid of them. Why? Because God put his name where? In Jerusalem. God put his name and his glory on the temple. That was a place where you were supposed to go and worship God and get rid of all these high places. That was a command of God. And by the way, these false cults and religions were so corrupt that there were even uh, religious prostitutes. Look down at verse 24 again. There were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. These were prostitutes that committed terrible immorality as a religious ritual at these high places. By practicing these sins of idolatry and immorality, Judah became no better than the Canaanites that were in the land before them. They were the same. These sins became common practice. And this was sad. You know why? Remember what God called Israel to do? You were to be a light to the the darkness of the Gentiles, to the nations. Instead of becoming a light, they also practiced the same darkness. And how does that apply to us tonight? As the church, as the people of God, we are to be the light. And when the world looks at the church and sees no difference in the behavior of those who claim to be children of God, if there's no difference in the behavior, then God is dishonored. We are not light. Worsby wrote this. He said, surveys indicate that when it comes to sexual morality, the quote-unquote born-again people in the churches don't live much differently than the unsafe people outside of the church. And I think that he's right. And so the Lord punished Rehoboam and Judah for their sins. So the question we have to ask ourselves tonight is, when we love anyone or anything more than God, or do we love, I should say, do we love anyone or anything more than God? And do we have these idols in our life? Do we tolerate sin? Because if these things are true of us, then we are in a place of spiritual deterioration. We are on a spiritual decline. You know what we need to do? We need to stop pretending. We need to stop thinking that everything is all right. We need to turn to the Lord and repent with all of our heart and get our hearts right where they need to be. Repent and forsake any sin in our life. Renew our life. Renew our love to the Lord and practice a life where where we are actually Uh, showing forth, can I say it like this, the the gold shields rather than the bronze shields of our life. Let me give you the third thing. There's delusion, there's deterioration. Another thing that was happening was division. These bronze shields were a reminder that they were a weakened nation. So look down in verse number 29. Here's the death of Rehoboam. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days... And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naama the Ammonitess, and Abijam his son reigned in his stead. All the time that Rehoboam was leader of this divided nation, um, there was no peace. And really the division made them weak, and it was really Rehoboam's fault that they were divided. It was his own foolish actions that caused this division. You know what? God's people, if anyone should be united, you know who it should be? It should be the people of God. You know what? We live in a divided nation. There are some people that live in a divided home. Some people worship in a divided church. Some people work in a place where there's division. 
If any place should be united, it should be the church and the people of God. But sad to say that sometimes, even among God's people, there are divisions. You know the thing that unites us all together? It's the Word of God. If we will believe and trust in the Word of God, then it will unite us all together. And so let me just close with this tonight. Let me ask you, what does your life reflect? Are you living a life that is reflecting uh, the gold standard, we could say, in your life where you're, you're truly loving God with all your heart? There's no idols in your life. There's no sin that you know of. Let the world see our gold shields as we live for God in our life. Did you know that in 1988, the Summer Olympics in Seoul, Korea, there was, a, there was a unique thing that took place. Ben Johnson of Canada won the 100-yard, or the 100-meter dash, I should say, and he set a new Olympic record, a new world record. The American contender of that race was Carl Lewis, another famous sprinter. He came in second, and people were shocked that he didn't win the gold medal. But after the race, you know, the judges learned that Ben Johnson had an illegal substance in his body. He had been using performance-enhancing drugs, and because of that, his gold medal was taken away. You know why? Because he was living a lie. That really wasn't who he was, and the judges saw that, and it was revealed before the whole world that he was living a lie. Do You know, one day we're going to stand before our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to reveal our life, whether the life that we live for him met the standard of gold or was it something lesser than that. We will be revealed before God what we really are. So, beloved, I would say this. Make sure that you're trusting Jesus alone for your salvation. Examine your life to make sure that you're living the way God wants you to live. Let's, let's bow for prayer tonight. Let's bow for prayer. And then I want you to, as you pray, I want you to just ask the Lord, Lord, would you search my heart? Would you point out if there's anything in my life that is dishonoring to you, displeasing to you? And would you help me, Lord, to have victory over this? Would you just say to God, God, I don't want to live a lie I don't want to pretend like everything is all right when it's not. Sin, when it's in the dark, has a damaging, disastrous effect in our life. But you know, the good thing is you can, in the quietness of where you are in your heart before God and God alone, you can, you can be honest with God. You can confess that sin to Him. You can repent to Him and Him alone. And you know what? When you turn to him with all your heart, he will forgive you. He will cleanse you. The sad thing about Rehoboam is he lived this delusion until he died. He never truly repented. May that never be said of us. May we truly live a life that's honoring to the Lord with no deception. May the world see the gold shields, not the bronze. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts tonight. We thank you and praise you again for how your word is constantly challenges us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.